This is Space Time, Series 25, Episode 95, coming up on Space Time. The DART-1 mission on track for an asteroid impact. NASA still looking at a potential Artemis 1 launch date this month. And growing plants in lunar soil. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Later this month, NASA's DART mission will slam a spacecraft into a tiny near-Earth asteroid, orbiting a slightly larger near-Earth asteroid, in order to see what happens. The target is the 170-metre-wide, potentially hazardous asteroid Dimorphos, originally called Diddy Moon. It's orbiting a 780-metre-wide, potentially hazardous asteroid called 65803 Didymos, which is part of the Apollo group of Earth-crossing asteroids. The Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART mission, will slam into Dimorphos on September the 26th. The mission is part of a planetary defence exercise, providing NASA and the European Space Agency with data about celestial bodies which could pose a threat to Earth. Recently, six nights of observations by the Lowell Observatory in Arizona and the Magellan Telescope in Chile have confirmed earlier orbital calculations about the asteroid's current positions and their orbital trajectories, confirming that DART is on target. Didymos and Dimorphos will make their closest approach to Earth in years at the time of the collision, passing just 10.8 million kilometres from our planet. Astronomers want to determine if the impact of the 610 kilogram DART spacecraft crashing into Dimorphos at some 6.6 kilometres per second alters its orbit around Didymos and how that in turn would affect the trajectory of both space rocks. Ten days prior to the impact, a small six-unit CubeSat built by the Italian Space Agency called the Light Italian CubeSat for Imaging Asteroids, or Lycia Cube, will be deployed from DART to monitor the impact and collect data. The orbit of Dimorphos around Didymos is expected to shorten by several minutes after the impact as the Moon moves closer to the bigger asteroid. By measuring the change with maximum precision, astronomers should be able to glean important information about Didymos' structure and properties and the materials it's made out of. In a collaborating project, the European Space Agency is developing HERA, a spacecraft that will be launched to Didymos in 2024, arriving there in 2027, five years after the DART impact. It'll undertake detailed reconnaissance and assessments, such as a detailed characterization of the impact crater and to determine any longer-term orbital changes. HERA will carry two six-unit CubeSats. Milani will study the binary asteroid's composition and Juventus will attempt to land on Dimorphos. This report from NASA TV. In case there was an asteroid coming towards Earth and you're there, you can actually stop it. I mean, that's kind of fantastic. NASA is crashing a spacecraft into an asteroid. What? You think science fiction, but this is real. Never in my life would I have thought I would take a couple hundred million dollar spacecraft and crash it into an asteroid. <laughs> My name is Michelle Chen. I'm Lena Adams. My name is Kelly Fast. I'm Andy Rifkin. I'm Justina Sorovitz, and I help tell the story of the DART mission. I'm a planetary defender. And I study how the orbits of asteroids change after we hit them with spacecraft. My job was primarily to make sure that all the systems on the spacecraft work together. The DART mission is NASA's first test of a planetary defense technique called Kinetic Impactor. DART is the double asteroid redirection test. It's just a spacecraft that is going to go and smack an asteroid. The moon lift Dimorphos, which orbits the asteroid Didymos. And see if we can change its trajectory just a little bit. In order to show that we can deflect incoming asteroids if we need to. DART will only be changing the period of the orbit of Dimorphos by a, a tiny amount. 
But in space, just a little bit is just enough to make an asteroid actually miss us. In the event that an asteroid is discovered well ahead of time before it might impact Earth. The spacecraft. It's really cool to see it coming together in real life. It is fantastic to see it in real life. To see it turn from ideas into real pieces that are gonna go into space. The solar arrays will actually roll out to 28 feet in length. Once the solar array that deploy is going to be the size of a school bus. As the solar array opens out, it's going to swing out. The asteroid's only two football fields in size. We're flying at over six kilometers a second. 30 days out, we see one pixel on our field of view. You can see Didymos and Dimorphos as one point of light. About four hours out, our spacecraft becomes autonomous. And then that's where everything gets really exciting. You actually are seeing impact. We're super excited and nervous as well. I feel really honored and humbled to be working in an area of science that has such a broader impact, you know, figuratively and literally. <laughs> so dark. The dinosaurs are made completely extinct by an asteroid impact so many years ago. Here we are, we can actually do something about it. I think this is just wonderful. This is space time. Still to come. NASA is still looking at a potential Artemis One launch date this month, and a new study looks at growing plants in lunar soil. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA says it's still looking at launch windows for the Artemis I mission for this month. The agency says it could target potential launch windows on September the 23rd or the 27th for the maiden flight of the Artemis I moon rocket. This new speculation comes despite earlier reports by NASA suggesting any new launch date for the Artemis I mission is most likely to be in late October. The giant space launch system SLS Moon Rocket has already had two launch attempts scrubbed because of a faulty engine cooling system, which turned out to be nothing more than a faulty sensor, and a persistent leak in liquid hydrogen fuel line feeds. And with SpaceX about to send a new crew to the International Space Station from neighbouring Pad 39A, any attempted launch for the mighty Artemis I mission to the Moon was expected to be postponed until at least the end of next month. But it turns out a September launch date would still be possible dependent on resolving two key issues. Firstly, they've got to fix those persistent leaks, which have been plaguing the launch pad's umbilical quick disconnect cryogenic fuel line system, which cycles the minus 253 degrees Celsius liquid hydrogen propellant into the rocket. That'll involve replacing a seal around a 20 centimeter fuel line and fixing a smaller leak on a connector. These would then need to be tested by conducting a wet fuel loading and cycling trial on the launcher, filling its main tanks with 2.79 million litres of supercold liquid hydrogen propellant and liquid oxygen oxidizer. Late last week, NASA decided to undertake the repairs and tests of its liquid hydrogen system on the launch pad rather than in the vehicle assembly building, as that would allow the tests to be carried out under actual operational conditions. The second issue is totally out of NASA's control. It requires the United States Space Force agreeing to issue a waiver to extend the time needed before checking the batteries on the SLS flight termination system. This is the system which triggers the self-destruct mechanism to destroy the rocket if it veers off course during the launch. The US Space Force requires the flight termination system to be tested every 25 days and that would require returning the 98-metre-tall rocket back to the vehicle assembly building. Now, if NASA is able to pursue a September 23rd launch for the Artemis One, it would need to lift off during a 120-minute launch window slated to open at 10.47 GMT. That would ultimately result in a return to Earth on October the 18th. On the other hand, a September 27th flight would have a smaller 70-minute launch window, opening at 1537 GMT, resulting in a return to Earth much later on November the 5th. Either way, the maiden flight of the Artemis One will test the SLS launch vehicle and its Orion spacecraft by undertaking an unmanned test flight beyond the Moon and back again. 
If successful, that would be followed by Artemis II in 2024 on a manned mission around the moon and back. And then Artemis III in 2025 would take humans back to the lunar surface for the first time since the Apollo 17 mission back in 1972, some 53 years ago. We'll keep you updated. This is Space Time. Still to come, growing plants in lunar soil, and later in the science report, discovery of an ancient reef-like landform hidden in plain sight on the Nullarbor Plain. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study reported in the journal Nature Biology has shown that lunar soil is worse for growing plants than even volcanic ash. Scientists tried to grow thale crest plants in soil taken from the moon and in volcanic ash from Earth. They found that while seedlings did grow in the lunar soil, it grew more slowly, took longer to develop expanded leaves, had more stunted roots and showed more stress-related pigments than those grown in volcanic ash. The authors speculate that cosmic ray and solar wind damage of lunar soils, as well as the presence of small iron particles in the soil, could be causing extra stress in the plants, impairing their development. A new study has found that disrupted blood flow caused by the microgravity environment of space could be one of the factors damaging astronauts' eyes. A report in the Journal of the American Medical Association says that swelling blood vessels in astronauts' heads may be contributing to eye-related problems. Researchers had previously found that astronauts returning from the International Space Station experienced worsening eyesight, damage to the retina, globe flattening, swelling optic nerves, and mildly elevated intracranial pressure, which collectively are now known as spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome. The author studied 12 astronauts, finding they all had higher volumes of blood flow in the head, and that suggests that this could be contributing to their spaceflight-associated neuroocular syndrome diagnosis. This is Space Time. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog, where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 